Hello, everybody. Welcome to this event, which is about the DCMS's proposals to change uh, the GDPR in the UK. Um, their proposal is called um, Data a New Direction. Our event is called Stop Data Discrimination, which we think is the inevitable result of these proposals. Um, this event's been organised by Open Rights Group and the Citizens as an attempt to raise awareness among the many, many groups and individuals who will be affected by these proposals. Uh, we're really keen that everybody responds to the DCMS's consultation and explains exactly what the impacts are going to be. So the event today will explore those these proposals and the impacts from a number of different angles. Uh, so first thing we're going to do is have a short presentation from Open Rights Group staff, uh, Sajid Dar and Mariano uh, Deli Santi, who will explain the broad uh, topics. Then we're going to have a panel discussion um, where we'll be talking in a bit more detail about these proposals with uh, Ravi Naik, who's a lawyer at AWO, James Farrar, who um, works for the uh, work, Workers Info Exchange, and with Uber drivers on employment rights uh, in the digital age, and Carol Kudbolader, who is a journalist and campaigner with uh, the Citizens, uh, who's well known, of course, for her work on um, Cambridge Analytica and Facebook uh, and other, other data issues. So without further ado, um, I will ask um, Sarja uh, and Mariano to um, start uh, the discussion. Um, and uh, I've just brought up their presentation, uh, which they'll be talking through. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Sadia, and I work at Open Rights Group, where I work on the impacts of data and technology on migrants' rights. My colleague Mariano, Open Rights Group's legal and policy officer, and I will be talking about how GDPR protects equalities and the impact the government's proposed reforms will have on our rights. I'm going to talk you through three examples that illustrate how GDPR protect, provides protection against discrimination and explain how the government's proposals will threaten these protections. The first example is Bounty, a pregnancy and parenting club, which was fined for sharing the personal data of mothers and their children. In 2019, Bounty was fined £400,000 for illegally selling this data with marketing agencies. The government's proposals to gut GDPR will allow unprecedented freedom to collect, use and share information for marketing purposes. This will allow companies like Bounty to sell personal data for profit, even without your consent. Next slide, please. The second example, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, is, with, is the controversial algorithm which was used last year to work out A-level grades. So last summer, hundreds of thousands of students were affected by an algorithm used to estimate their A-level grades. The marks they received didn't reflect their hard work or intellectual ability. The algorithm produced discriminatory and biased outcomes based on teacher assessments, class sizes and postcode. Students from BAME and working class backgrounds were hardest hit. The government was forced to U-turn as a result of a legal challenge brought by Foxglove and A-level student Curtis Parfit Ford. Under the government's new proposals, Article 22 will be scrapped. This will mean that individuals won't be able to challenge decisions taken opaquely and without human review by AI or other automated tools. Next slide, please. The third and final example is digital strip searches of victims. In June 2020, a legal challenge brought by Big Brother Watch forced the police to abandon digital strip searches of victims. The policy allowed officers to ask for consent from victims of, of sexual violence to extract data from their digital devices. Victims who refused ran the risk of the investigation into their complaint being dropped. Essentially, victims were being forced to choose between their privacy or justice. The policy failed victims and allowed perpetrators to escape justice. 
Under the proposals, the government will have unprecedented power to collect and use data for law enforcement purposes. The ICO, the data watchdog, will have to balance its duty to uphold data rights against its duty to uphold public safety, making it harder to, to scrutinize and challenge law enforcement's use of data. So these are just three examples, but there are many, many more. We hope that they've given you a sense of how data protection protects your rights. My colleague Mariano will now go into more detail about the shape of these proposals. Hi everyone. So I will try to build on the examples that uh, Sadia just gave you by taking one step back and uh, giving a more broad and overarching view of uh, uh, how this proposal is going to affect uh, people and their rights. A first area I want to talk about is the implications of this proposal for the private sector use of data. Nowadays, data is being routinely used to hire, to fire, to offer or deny services, or otherwise take decisions that affect individuals. This is why the GDPR uh, provided and enshrined safeguards to ensure that in this process, the rights and the interests of individuals are properly considered. And this is where uh, the UK government proposal will instead undermine many of the safeguards that are provided nowadays and uh, possibly enable discrimination. A useful example of how this will work in practice is given for uh, by their proposal to reform legitimate interest and in particular to scrap the balancing test. Legitimate interest is one of the six legal bases that are provided by the GDPR that you can choose from to use personal data. And it differs from other legal bases in that uh, you just need to claim to have a reasonable interest to do something without uh, meeting any particular conditions, such as uh, obtaining consent or having a contract or being uh, invested uh, with a, public, a task in the public interest or whatnot. There is, however, an important safeguard, and of course, uh, for a good reason, which is called the balancing test. So your interest must be balanced against uh, the rights of the individuals whose data you are using. And in practice, this means that you cannot use personal data under this clause, which is a very flexible clause for users that would uh, have discriminatory results or otherwise hurt people. Therefore, uh, the balancing test is basically the thing that uh, separates what is a legitimate use of data or uh, an abuse of data. And this is exactly what the government would like to remove for a, a very long and vaguely defined list of legitimate interest activities. An example of, of how this will work in practice is given, for instance, by one of the uh, activities that they would like to exempt from this balancing test, which is, which is uh, improving customer, uh, customer services. You probably may have heard of this um, uh, this term before because it's uh, very, very commonly used by organizations around the world to use your data for uh, whatever reason they uh, deem correct. And this basically means that whenever an organization can claim that they're using data in order to uh, improve customer services, such as when they are selling data to third parties in order to improve direct marketing or to build a profile about you, this would uh, eventually become legal because on the other hand, the potential discriminatory impact of this process is not being weighted anymore against the interest of the organization to build this profile about you. This is one example. Another example is the proposal to water down and to punch holes in the proposed limitation principle, uh, which would in turn allow personal data to be reused in new ways you did not agree to. This in turn enables discrimination and decisions about people to be taken based on information an individual didn't mean to disclose in the particular context where this decision is being taken, or in other, way, in other words, based on information an individual is meant to get private. Finally, uh, there are uh, different proposals in, this, in um, uh, this document brought forward by the DCMS which are proposing to remove existing duties for organizations to uh, assess and to mitigate risks to ensure that the rights uh, of individuals are protected against discrimination and harm. And here I'm talking in particular about the data protection impact assessment, which is a governance measure which was introduced by the GDPR where uh, organizations need to basically consider the risk of uh, uh, 
uh, unintended consequences that could harm individuals and put measures in place in order to avoid this. Asking organizations not to do this anymore or relieving them of the duty of do, doing this anymore opened the floodgates to discrimination, where companies will have no duty basically to assess uh, the consequences of what they're doing. We now move to the second point and to the next slide, which is instead about uh, the use of public the use of data by the public sector. Because also the public sector, of course, can discriminate and take decisions uh, based on data as well. Here, we link this with something that I mentioned before, which is the proposed limitation principle. Nowadays, if uh, the government wants to allow uh, the use of personal data in breach of the proposed limitation principle, so let's say if they want to take data away from a context where they were collected and use them for a different purpose in the public interest, let's say, they need to meet uh, a number of safeguards which are listed in Article 23 of the GDPR. And basically, this means that uh, the use of data uh, as it is described in the law will need to be necessary, will need to be proportionate, and there will need to be security measures in place to prevent uh, abuses of this data or reuse of this data for reasons which are not in the public interest. The government is aware of proposing to create uh, another clause which allows the use of, of uh, data for incompatible purposes for uh, the substantial public interest, which in turn is allowed to circumvent the safeguards that Article 22 would, pro 23 would provide. Now, this is a bit technical, but there is an example that can probably help you understand how this works in practice. And this is the National Fraud Initiative. This is a program that's been run by the cabinet office where different records are being apprehended, analyzed in order to uh, identify fraud. So basically uh, it entails taking uh, employment records, matching them against the uh, uh, benefits records about unemployment and seeing if somebody's working while claiming an employment record, for instance. This uh, is a, let's say, uh, very, I mean, it's a, a very dangerous uh, processing because the, of the consequences that this, it entails. Uh, this uh, data matching eventually leads government to investigate, to prosecute, to dismiss, to fire, or to imprison people. And of course, the presence of uh, suitable safeguards on what information the government can use in order to take certain decisions is uh, fundamental in this sense, even more considering that government is, is uh, uh, proposing to expand this program. And so to use this power to match data across the digital economy in order to identify other crimes or uh, other interests that they uh, deem appropriate. And uh, of course, introducing a, a punch in the hole that I was mentioning before uh, allows programs like this one to be implemented without suitable safeguards in place. I started with this example because uh, the, uh, it's a bit of a late motive. The government is trying to basically uh, remove many of the safeguards, many of the tools that held them to account in the past. And this, for instance, goes into uh, a lot of uh, recent failures or scandals that you might remember. We mentioned already the uh, A-level a grading, but also there were a lot of issues with uh, how the government responded to COVID and how they ran their procurement around it. Uh, you might remember the Google DeepMind scandal and the illegal seizure of uh, medical data of NHS patients. Or you might uh, know about uh, the illegal deployment of live facial recognition technology by the police. Now, these were all instances where the government were held to account or uh, were challenged based on things like the right to human review, Article 22 of the GDPR, or based on data protection impact assessment, based on the accountability framework. And these are all things that the government is looking forward to remove with their new proposal. We move to the final aspect that I want to draw your attention to, which is uh, uh, remedies and accountabilities. Because another important aspect of the GDPR is, of course, that it gave you remedies and it gave you avenues to redress against uh, issues with the use of your data. The government, on the other hand, is proposing to make matters worse and to basically put obstacles in the way you can exercise these rights so you can have access to these remedies. 
The first and maybe the most important one is about the right to access, which uh, has been uh, an instru a very instrumental right in terms of uh, uncovering malpractices and giving evidence of abuses that could later be used to challenge discrimination. However, the government proposal would need, for instance, uh, would, I mean, the government is proposing, for instance, to impose a nominal fee on the on a subject access request, which means you have to pay in order to access your data. And it's also empowering organizations to reject your request to access your data, either because they don't trust the motives that are driving you or because they can claim a cost cap limit. Same happens with uh, uh, your right to uh, complain to the ICO about abuses. Now, uh, this will become more difficult because you will have to uh, get in touch before and to negotiate with the organization that uh, you are accusing of discrimination before uh, talking to the authorities. And this goes together with the pow uh, uh, extended power of the SEO to basically decide whether they want to uh, take your complaint into account or whether they don't believe that this is um, uh, worth uh, considering. Uh, this is even worse if you go into another proposal that the government is putting forward, which is about uh, tasking the ICO with a duty to consider uh, the impact of the regulatory action, so basically the impact of uh, enforcing the law on innovation and growth. This in effect means that uh, enforcing the law will become more difficult when uh, you are challenging uh, uses of data which are discriminatory but are profitable or are being run by businesses who uh, are, let's say, big and who depend on these practices. Examples of that are the field of online advertisement, are the field of tech, uh, and these kind of things. And this is the same uh, uh, concept that applies for uh, something that Sadia mentioned at the beginning of her presentation that was the uh, duty of balancing uh, enforcement against public safety. Finally, and this is, <laughs> let's say, uh, the last layer of uh, uh, how the government is making it difficult to uh, hold uh, offenders to account, is about uh, the fact that the government would like to be given the power to uh, that dictate priorities to the ICO. So basically to tell them what they should uh, focus on, what they should scrutinize and what they shouldn't. And they would also like to have the power to amend the commissioner's salary without parliamentary approval. I will finish this presentation by, uh, first of all, drawing, uh, uh, let's say, small conclusion on how these uh, different points interact together. First of all, is it will be very more difficult for you to claim that someone is operating illegally or is discriminating you because the legal boundaries of what is permissible and what is not have been uh, expanded significantly. However, even if, uh, even if you do, even if you manage to uncover, uh, let's say, discriminatory practices, you will then find uh, many obstacles in your way to basically obtaining remedies and obtaining justice. And even if you do, the government always has the power to basically break the watch, watch that they should hold to account, that should hold them to account, and for instance, uh, cut their salary if they uh, start to uh, do things that they don't agree with. So this is a, a, a very incomplete, but hopefully a useful um, overview of uh, how this uh, proposal would impact uh, the rights of individuals. And we go to the final slide, which is uh, a thank you for uh, listening to us. If you have uh, questions, of course, you can uh, contact uh, either us or Sadia or anyway, you can find in our uh, webpage, uh, Stop Data Discrimination, useful guides on how everything that we just talked about and more works in practice and how you can basically answer to, uh, you can basically raise your concerns about these aspects in the uh, consultation to come, which ends on the uh, 19th of November. So thank you very much. Thank you. Mariano, so we're now going to talk to um, Ravi uh, Naik for a few minutes about his perspective um, on this. Um, so 
Ravi, uh, to just kind of start, um, could you just give us a little bit of background um, about AWO's work and the kind of uh, discrimination that you see um, at AWO that you try to combat through uh, data protection? Thanks, Jim. And <clears throat> thank you for, for having me here today. It's really great to be part of this conversation with such an important consultation underway. Um, so, yeah, I'm a practicing solicitor um, at AWO, and that gives me quite, quite a unique perspective because it shows what it's like to try to use the law and stand by the law for individuals rather than kind of thinking about the law in the abstract. And, you know, I like this framing that Open Rights Group have put on this about the discriminatory outcomes and thinking about how data might, or poor data practices might lead to discriminatory outcomes. And we really see that throughout our practice. So just for example, just one example of one of the types of cases we deal with. Um, we deal with cases concerning financial blacklisting where <clears throat> individuals and organizations face financial difficulty because they've been unlabelly, unfairly labeled as a financial risk. And often when we get involved with those clients, they don't really know why or what's happened. They don't understand the basis. We help them to unpick the basis for that profiling and learn a little bit more about what led to these financial risks for them and that financial blacklisting. And what we often see is that when we see the data that underpins it, it's based on a mischaracterization and often basic racism where people are being labeled as terrorism risks for being involved with university projects to do with um, understanding the history of terrorism and, and Islamic issues. So understanding how data is being used is really important for individuals to, to really unpack the, the discriminatory outcomes that can be used from poor data practices. And that's a thread that runs throughout our practice. We see unfair outcomes throughout most of our cases. In fact, that's the basis on which we, we, we tend to operate. And it's really important that Open Rights Group <coughs> are highlighting this wider important context. Thank you, Ravi. Um, so another example, uh, which I, I've really been interested in at AWO is, is that of uh, gambling. Um, after all, gamblers are a vulnerable group. They're dealing with addiction and yet, uh, you've had to target that you've actually had to make complaints around the companies um, because those those gamblers are being targeted for essentially further sales um, so could, could you tell us a little bit about uh, that and, and and how the just the companies attempt to justify targeting gambling addicts yeah it's a really interesting case it's like I say one of a number of different cases that we have that highlights the this kind of discriminatory outcome that you're, you're focusing on today. And also, I'm sure we'll go on to speak about how the problems of the, the proposed reforms and the consultation. So we act for a number of reformed gamblers who've tried to understand how online gambling led to their addiction and whether there's a difference between the online environment and the real world environment of say going to a casino. And these individuals came to us not really sure of how they had been targeted by gambling companies or let alone what data was being collected about them and when we got involved with with these individuals we realized there was no transparency really about how their data was being used. they weren't told at the outset you know your data might be used in the, the following ways so we embarked on um, a quest to try and find out that information and find out how that information had been weaponized and so that they could be exploited and what we saw that was that individuals had been really profiled on their vulnerabilities how often they're gambling when they're gambling what games they are most likely to stay addicted to and actually they were valued on how much they'd be worth if they were won back after they'd stopped gambling you know this is it seems quite anodyne and quite uh, unclear but when you think about how that information can be used to keep people hooked you start to understand how data can be used and how it can be weaponized to cause real world harms. And it actually shows that individuals don't really understand how this is happening in real time. They have to use the tools that is in, within the data protection regime to stop this kind of exploitation, stop this kind of um, targeting on the basis of vulnerabilities. Um, so it's a really important example, and it's just one example of how the data protection framework helps vulnerable individuals and helps gain um, a foothold and some power and um, control where it 
organisations have real power over individuals' lives. Thank you. Uh, I think perhaps perhaps a, a sort of final question we could just, um, Ravi, maybe we could just talk about a little bit of what you've seen in the consultation document and what's really worrying you about the approach uh, that's been taken, you know, just how it would affect your work effectively. Yeah, well, it's really important to think about the, the consultation as a whole. I mean, it's 146 pages, so Mariana did a very good job of trying to distill some of the main issues, but it is a lengthy, detailed document. And I think on the one hand, there are some things to be welcomed, you know, trying to make access to data for researchers clearer and easier is, is a really important thing, really being able to investigate how Facebook uses data, for example, by researchers is to be welcomed. Um, but actually, for the most part, it is concerning. And I think rather than talk about all 146 pages, I'll talk about three examples of some of the problems that are within the proposed consultation. Firstly, there is this change to subject access requests that Mariano talked about. And often the idea of accessing information, understanding information is the first step towards accountability, as I'm sure James will talk about in his work and work I've worked with James on it in trying to work out what Uber was doing. Um, what the government proposes to do, or what the DCMS consultation proposes to do, is two changes. Firstly, is to introduce a fee regime. Now, introducing some low-level fees might not seem the worst thing in the world. And you know, £10 here or there might not be prohibitive, but actually it's the bureaucracy of trying to make a payment that can in practice make subject access requests very hard to, to put in place. For example, before we had the old regime with the £10 fee, we'd have to send checks off to random places in America and it would take months to get through and get cashed. And by the time you'd actually got your response, you were ages away. And that's why getting rid of the fee regime was really helpful because it actually empowered people to make requests. And secondly, and probably more damningly, is the government is seeking to imbue purpose into a request saying that you know, data controllers can effectively ask why a request is being made. We talked about the gambling um, context. People are often intimidated by going to the controllers saying, this is why I want my information. Having not being able to ask why a request is being made is really important because it ensures people can make speculative requests. The whole purpose of a subject access request is to understand how your information is being used. So imbuing some purpose into the request and allowing requests to be rejected because you are potentially irritated by the request is really problematic. Secondly, as, as, as Mariano talked about, there is this change to how legitimate interests can be used by data controllers. It sounds very abstract and nebulous, but what does that mean in practice? It means that the behavioral advertising ecosystem effectively gets legitimized en masse without any controls. And we see in the work we're doing with <coughs> Open Rights Group, how problematic that would be in practice. I mean, I think the industry itself recognizes how problematic the current behavioral advertising ecosystem is. The UK government trying to legitimate, legitimize that entire industry without proper controls is very problematic, particularly where there is no balance against the individuals that are impacted by it. And thirdly, trying to remove the independence of the Information Commissioner's Office is really problematic. And I think if you just take a step back and think about one of the wider consequences of this might all have, is that we have an adequacy agreement with Europe right now that means that we can pass data to Europe and back and forth. That adequacy agreement is really under pressure and under threat by these proposed reforms and the costs to business will be quite substantial. So I think there needs to be some real thought and pause for concern before these uh, reforms are put in place, both to protect our individual liberties and the economic costs that they might entail. Thank you very much, Ravi. So we'll come back to Ravi uh, in general questions. And I see a few people are asking, uh, making some points. If you've got a particular question you want to ask, please use the Q&A function. I'll come to those uh, once we sort of talk to, to each of the panellists a little bit more. Um, so next, I'm going to ask James a few questions. James Farrow, we're talking with uh, for, uh, Workers Info Exchange, been instrumental in a number of uh, very important legal challenges that clarify 
uh, workers' rights. So just asking a general question, James, why did you turn to data protection in your work as a trade unionist and workers' rights campaigner? Um, might might seem quite sort of uh, you know surprising to some people that 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 is in fact where you sort of the pivot point for you and, and your work. Well, thanks, Jim. Thanks for thanks for um, inviting Work Info Exchange here, and it's um, it's it's great to be part of this panel discussion. Um, the to answer your question was very personal for me, actually. Um, I went to the Employment Tribunal um, to argue for uh, worker rights against Uber, and Uber came to that tribunal hearing with all my personal data to use against me. And what they what they tried to do was conflate um, the 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 work that I had declined, refused, or cancelled. Uh, with the work that I had actually done. Uh, so I had a quite a high cancellation rate of the work that Uber offered me. And they said their argument for the court, and in fact, in, in front of Parliament, so the Bay Subcommittee on the Future World of Work um, inquiry, was to say with this specific, specific example, using my data to say, why should we give this guy the minimum wage? He's canceling all these jobs. But actually, when, when I looked at the data, I found actually that wasn't the right measure at all. If you looked at the work that I did do, not the work that I declined, I was at the higher end of productivity working 90 hours that Uber said they expected at 40 to 60 hours in their onboarding documents. So they openly used my data against me to, 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 to paint a picture of a different type of work to deny me rights and to go to parliament in front of the courts and to go to parliament to make the same argument. And that was a wake up point for me that we absolutely have to get access uh, to, to our data. Um, it's, been a tough, it's been a tough challenge and the subject access requests uh, are really, really important. Um, but Jim, for me, you know, what, what's really clear now is how um, these rights integrate together and how they can't be separated. So access rights are um, as good as having the explanation of logic processing, the algorithmic transparency. You need both together, not one or the other. And then when you have that, then you can understand what types of automated decisions uh, that need to be challenged in your workplace. And I can take you through some of those examples. I mean, for me, it's a bit like going to your doctor and your doctor taking a blood sample and saying, you know, your blood is, is analogous to your data, right? And, and, and you say, the doctor looks at it and says, that's very interesting. But of course, what the doctor needs to understand is how that blood was processed through your body. And, and he will understand that by, or she will understand that by, by testing for other compounds, but also sometimes by imaging. And it's the same with data, just the data alone, but not understanding how your personal data was processed. Um, by a company, your employer, so on. It's so important that those things go together. And as soon as you have that picture, then you understand how you've been managed at work, for example, which is what our area of interest is. And these rights come together and all of those are under threat now with this DCMS review, the ability to access your data, uh, the algorithmic transparency that you need. And then of course, your ability then to challenge automated decisions uh, that affect you deeply as a, as, a, as a worker. And finally, on this front, on this issue of discrimination, you know, according to Transport for London, uh, there are 100,000 um, private hire drivers in London, most of them working for apps. 94% of them are BME. Uh, all of them have very weak employment protections. Even what we won at the Supreme Court is just worker status, it's bottom rung. It does not entitle you to any protection from unfair dismissal. And at the moment, we know from freedom of information requests that uh, Transport for London, out of the 100,000 workers, about 70,000 are active and about 40,000 of them are with Uber. And in the year ending uh, the 1st of September this year, 10,100 of them were dismissed. All of them will have been dismissed in an automated or semi-automated way because there is no other way to process them at, at Uber. There's no HR department. There is no appeal. You're going to get an automated message that you're out. And, um, and there will have been no reasonable grounds for appeal or even investigate what's happened. And again, this is why you know, access rights are so important because what happens with these drivers is that as soon as they are dismissed, and that's uh, informed to Transport for London, they face um, immediate revocation of their license. And then when you go to court, to the magistrate's court to appeal for that license, it is incumbent upon you to prove to the magistrates that that decision to strip you of your public license was a wrong one. It's not their 
burden to prove that you've done something wrong. It's your burden to prove that their decision to fire you, that their decision to strip you of the public license was a wrong one. How are you going to do that without access to data, without access to the understanding of how your dismissal was, was um, processed and so on? Uh, so these, these rights are very important, very, uh, and very, very central uh, to the gig economy, to misclassification, um, what's happened since the Supreme Court ruling this year is that the gig platforms understand that contract as a means of control is dead because statute uh, trumps that. So no more dodgy contracts. So now these companies are, are, are doubling down on algorithmic control, hidden algorithmic control. And so that's misclassification 2.0. We can't fight that with weak employment rights and even weaker uh, data protection laws than we have at the moment. Thank you, James. You, you won a uh, legal challenge against Uber for uh, automated or robo-firing uh, employees. Can you tell us about the Supreme Court's ruling against Uber and what that means for what you would call digital, what we, what we might call digital employment rights? Well, um, yes. We so we have won um, a number of cases uh, against Uber um, for automated dismissals in Amsterdam uh, at the uh, at the uh, district court there. Uh, Uber have uh, pretended in a way they didn't fight these cases and they accepted a default judgment. Uh, we got a, a dog ate their homework uh, excuse, um, but really we believe. They didn't want the legal analysis. They didn't want to come to court and be transparent about it. And so those six drivers were uh, reinstated, paid compensation um, and damages uh, in the court. But we've, we've far more uh, work to do. We've also uh, sued Uber and Ola Cabs for uh, transparency um, and access to data. Uh, what was interesting in some of the, some of the outcome from that is Ola, you know, Ola, Ola profiles drivers and gives them a fraud score, a fraudulent score, fraudulent. So it's kind of like a, you know, an ethical sort of moral um, assessment, a mathematical moral assessment. And what they're trying to figure out is like when, when they were challenged, what do you mean by fraud? Well, what they mean is by, you know, you're not obeying the rules. But then again, what rules? Because they, they won't set rules because that would be an employment relationship. So these are kind of implied rules of, of working that you have to kind of understand and obey. It's not criminal fraud uh, by no stretch of the imagination. But then those profiles are used in work allocation decisions. So Jim and I could be sitting on a street corner waiting, and he's, he's far more um, ethical than I am, and he's got a higher score for all, well, at Ola than I do. And so Jim is going to get the work faster than I am, and he's going to get faster and more, more quality and quantity of work than I am. And so the court has ruled that th those types of profiles now have to be made transparent in work allocation. Um, but, you know, again, this, these, these decisions, you know, uh, unfair dismissals are kind of eye-catching, because they're dramatic but what's pervasive is work allocation decisions you know this is this is what's alive for zero hours workers you know is there a profile is there some algorithmic calculation of who's going to work tomorrow and therefore who's going to eat tomorrow and who's going to be left sitting on the street uh, these are really really important aspects of um, decision making we've now we've challenged those and we've we've had some good results we still have a long way to go but you know uh, i'm really worried about the fee regime that would just kill it dead. I mean, even a small amount of money to pay is, is going to be too much. And particularly as we try to build collective data rights, as we try to build a picture of, of, um, of, of a workforce that is trying to build collective bargaining power, any fee at all is going to, is going to kill that dead. And this issue of what's vexatious? Well, of course this is vexatious. You know, I've heard Uber's data protection officers say at a conference, that when the number of DSAR requests go up, he knows that trust in the company has fallen. Well, there you have it. It's an important mechanism of public accountability and transparency. There's a reason why people make subject access requests and there's a reason why you should be accountable to answer them. And then finally, on this issue of group access, we really find it strange that the government is saying, well, if you're a marginalized person, you can always turn to some other group who will make a request on your behalf. Well, that's the truth at the moment. But at the moment, the gig economy companies are riding roughshod. We have power of attorney. We have independent authentication of identification. And yet they ride right over that and go straight back to the worker. 
um, and it's a it's a means of intimidation, delay, and so on. So that is already not working, and it's not going to work in the future either. So the, these are it's not just a problem of the fees and reduced access rights, but the assumptions that the government is making about what might be vexatious and how other groups might be able to represent the individual are just completely wrong. Thank you, James. Um, so what, what, in your view, is driving the, rate, the rise of surveillance tech in the, in the gig economy? Um, well, th this is really important point. Um, you know, Uber lost their license uh, because 22 drivers out of 90,000 screened over several years managed to upload a fake picture to their account and therefore maybe send out a mate to do the job for you on that night who was not licensed. A really bad thing to do, but it was 22 out of 90,000 over several years. And this was not rocket science. All they did was simply reset their GPS parameters outside the UK where, there isn't, where, the, where the market is not regulated, uploaded a picture and then reset back to the UK. This was not, this was not really very complicated stuff. That has been, that, that has been closed off. But Transport for London took a very hard line. Uber lost their license over that. And one day before TfL revoked the license, Uber rushed into TfL to offer to introduce surveillance tech, real-time identification, facial recognition systems. And uh, TfL said, well, that's very interesting. You should do that. But, you know, it's a bit late now. Let's go through the process. And so Uber did go through the process. They rushed out the implementation of that so that it would be in place before their hearing in September last year. And uh, the court, the magistrates, did make it a condition of their license to do real-time identification. And since then, this has become a de facto standard. The problem is, is that if TfL wanted to make it a regulatory standard, they should have put it out for consultation. They should have put it out for an independent impact assessment. They should have put it out for an independent equalities impact assessment. But none of that was done because we just got Uber to do it through the back door and it becomes a de facto Walmart type standard. And now we see Bolt, which is the big European app, went out specifically to raise money in the venture capital market just before Christmas last year um, to go and invest in exactly this tech. So um, they've introduced facial recognition, so has um, uh, Ola Cabs, Deliveroo. And so we've seen this technology now really proliferate. And it's also because of the Supreme Court ruling, it is also being used as well as a means of worker control outside contract. It's, it's misclassification 2.0. It's also become very attractive for the police. So the police have now made, in last year, made 2,500 requests for data from Uber. Whereas in all of the United States for the same period, Uber only answered 5,000 for all of the police forces in America. So the Met here in London has become really quite addicted to this honey pot of data that's been handed out as well. So we need to be concerned about these civil liberties, not only in terms of worker rights, but also in terms of civil liberties rights as well, that this data may not be accessible to workers, but it sure is accessible to government security services even without warrant. Thank you. Um, so I think just just really briefly, uh, uh, what are the which of the uh, proposed GDP chart changes are worrying you the most? Well, the um, the, the the idea that um, access rights uh, would be controlled by a fee is just disastrous. It would it would kill stone dead any ability to establish a data trust for workers, because I, I don't know how we would get over that. This idea of um, a vexatious request, uh, I don't know who gets to decide that. It would seem to me that the possession of the data is nine tenths of the law. I mean, it's questionable even whether that's Uber's own data, for example, because Uber says that the relationship is between the driver and the, uh, and, and the rider, and they're just simply an agent. So what, what are they doing controlling the data? But getting access to that data and what's vexatious, we would be on, on an uphill battle to, to, to justify asking for such data. Um, so the, these, are, these are really important issues. And then finally, I think around Article 22, legitimate interest, um, and what becomes a legitimate interest and where you know, profit and consumer interests and innovation is put behind um, individual rights and worker rights. An example of that we already see is that we've had these facial recognition cases um, where we're, we're suing Uber for discrimination because we know the tech is not effective on, with people of color. And in one case, Uber has admitted the mistake, so has Transport for London reinstated the driver, person of color, I 
we don't have time now, but I can show you the pictures later. His brother died and he grew a beard and, that, and the facial recognition didn't recognize him. He was fired and then TfL stripped him of his license. Now, um, when ITV News covered that piece, Uber's response was, well, look, you know, no technology is perfect. Our job is to make the platform as safe as possible for everybody. So implicit there is that, you know, this guy, Imran Javed Raja, was a necessary victim. And it's an acceptable price to pay for Uber having a safe platform for the future. Well, that's the future of legitimate interest in Article 22 then. Uh, you will be a sacrificial lamb for the greater good uh, and uh, Uber and uh, platform operators like them will make that decision. That's a very dangerous world we enter into. Those are the things I'm worried about. Thank you very much, James. Okay, so next we'll turn to Carol. Uh, I'm sure everybody knows her work. Um, and uh, we'll just talk a little bit about the political aspects of this. So, uh, Carol, the these, the political aspects do seem particularly worrying. Um, so in, in your journalism, what kind of manipulative practices seem most attractive to political campaigners, in your view? I mean, it's still, the thing about it is, is that I feel that, you know, I, I've been sort of down this rabbit hole for the last four or five years, and I still know almost nothing. <laughs> I mean, it's still the, 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 it's still so opaque, it's so murky, you know, and this is, this is after actually the laws worked in a way, you know, we saw Facebook, the ICO FETs fined Facebook, you know, it's maximum fine at the time, half a million pounds. So, so you know, the, these, and, and, you know, everybody got fined, you know, the, 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 there were sort of fines flying around all, all over the place, but yeah, we still know almost practically nothing around, how, you know, where they got data from, how, how they used that to build profiles, how they targeted people, what they targeted people with. Um, it's still all incredibly murky. And that's with, the, you know, that's with the, 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 the regime that we have. So, so sort of the idea that we're going to sort of get rid of that now, and there's going to be no sort of controls or, um, you, you know, legal requirements around that. I, I do think is is pretty terrifying because, you know, every day and every year, the sources of data on you, the granularity, the amount of stuff that's just out there waiting to be hoovered up by some company grows and grows and grows. And, uh, and you know, the sort of the younger people who are coming online you know, they've had a entire lifetime of stuff which has been sucked up. So, so I, I you know, I, I, it's, it's for me, it's for me, it's this, this, you know, the, the, the sort of toxic sludge, which is out there, um, and which political parties have had access to uh, already. You know, the idea that we're going to lift these safeguards now and, and you know, even to the degree that we have it is, I think, you know, incredibly worrying. Thank you. And um, so, I mean, there's a lot of money slushing about in all of this and a lot of close relationships between companies seeking to use personal data and the current political administration. That seems to be fueled by the pandemic. Um, so should we review this reform as being driven primarily by those commercial interests? And if so, what does that say about the future of our data economy? I mean, again, it's incredibly murky. I mean, so for example, you know, to take one example, which is a company called Faculty, which is owned and run by you know, these guys were very, very close acquaintances of Dominic Cummings. And they were involved. And it basically, I've been on such a sort of journey with this company because what happened is in the summer of 2017, I read all like 120,000 words of Dominic Cummings's blog, whatever it was, because I was on the hunt to find the, the secret physicists. So he wrote in his blog about how, oh, we had these amazing secret physicists who like, you know, they did really clever stuff with data. It was like, you know, it's like the Palantir of politics and they like found this amazing data and they were scraping it 
and um, and it was all a total secret and nobody knows who they are. And so I was like, who are they? And I kind of went on this hunt and, um, and eventually I kind of figured it out from an invoice in the electoral commission's register, which was, there was one invoice and it was called, which said advanced skills initiative. And at the time faculty were called ASI. And I was like, oh, advanced skills. And I, anyway, and I was like, oh, okay, that's the company, you know, and I knew that company because they'd worked with Cambridge Analytica separately. So there's this, so that, that, that this sort of like the whole thing of like what they did, what faculty did during the referendum, we still have no idea about none, none whatsoever. They've never answered a single press inquiry. They've never answered questions. So that's still murky. Then they, you know, then the, the, the guy who was the founder went on to work in the general election 2019. Now there was a story which I wanted to do. I was trying, Ravi knows about this, I think. I was trying to get out before that election and I couldn't because Shillings sent the uh, observer a letter. So sort of like on the, on the Friday before, you know, I was due to publish on the Sunday. So that, that we never got that information out. And then they, you know, they turn up winning these contracts in the pandemic. Now they've got our health data. So you've got a company which has done this very, you know, it's done this political work for the Conservative Party in two really major elections. And now they've got a contract in government where they're taking or they're handling like all of our health data as well. And so there's just like this really massive questions about that. And it might, it may well be, I have no idea. And I'm saying this, you know, Mr. Shillings, I'm not making any accusations here. I have no idea what they are doing with our health data, if anything at all. But this, the fact of having a company which has that access to this really, really, you know, in private, intimate data, and the fact that they have worked for a political party in profiling us to target us in an election. Now that is, that is, you know, I think, I, I don't think it takes a genius to realize that that's suboptimal. Um, so that that's just, you know, and that's, that's just a single, that's just a single example. And there's the, you know, there's, there's a lot of other different companies doing all sorts of things. Um, so yes, murky. Yes. And, and a no accusations there, shillings, nothing. I've said nothing untoward. <laughs> Indeed. I, I, at the same time, a lot of the advisors seem to be floating around the cabinet office and so on still. And uh, it's a sort of, the, you know, this proposal does feel a little bit like it is, uh, sorry to say, but Dominic Cummings' brainchild. You know, he was notoriously against GDPR, he disliked it, probably got in the way, probably meant he had to, you know, find some uh, strange ways of justifying things, shall we say, uh, in his political work. Um, and then his appointees, as you say, come from these companies, faculty and so on. And now they're rewriting the law. Um, and guess what? Yeah, exactly. And also what's kind of, you know, what's sort of a terrible, terrible irony of this is because the focus that when Dominic Cummings was doing this in the referendum, carte blanche, nobody knew anything. You know, we were really, really, you know, sleepwalking. We really didn't. I mean, us as individuals, me, certainly, I had no idea of this kind of murky world. And it was only sort of subsequently that I think, you know, we started becoming aware of it and that, you know, this, this whole idea of like these Facebook dark ads and things. And so we, there was this sort of, you know, there was this rising awareness and that put scrutiny and pressure on the likes of Dominic Cummings. And he didn't like that scrutiny and pressure. And he didn't like the fact that the ICO came asking questions and the Electoral Commission came asking questions. And so that's kind of, I think, very much has fed into the thinking, which is that these pesky journalists and annoying politicians are getting in the way of this like beautiful vision. I mean, he's kind of, you know, the thing with Dominic Cummings is he shares this sort of like, the Silicon Valley dream of, you know, technology will save us. And if only the tech bros had enough access to like enough data, we can build this beautiful dream of the future and it's gonna be amazing. And you know what, for Dominic Cummings and his friends in Silicon Valley, it will be amazing. Like, guess what? As a rich white man, this is gonna be a, like a fantastically bright and shining future in which they will get rich and you know live happily ever after in taking their ubers around town 
but for you know it's that and it's just that thing is that the the, the people who are the people who are in the room making these decisions are a tiny tiny cohort of incredibly privileged western white men and the the damages which uh, and the sort of unintended consequences the people who it's actually going to hit the the sharp end of it they are not those people and they're not in the room and um and that's where you know hearing james talk about the ways that you know that it's, I, I think this thing of like, I think James, what he was saying is so important because in that way, Uber and the Uber drivers and what's happening to them, they are the canary in the coal mine, that they are, um, you know, they're really, really at the sharp edge of it and they have no rights and they have no power. And it's only through this kind of, you know, organization, you know, the likes of James and Ravi who are able to help them access their rights through the laws that we have now that we know of any of this and they've been able to challenge it and the point is is that the government is intentionally ripping up all of those safeguards and you know at the heart of this you read that legislation and you read what their, their intention is and it's very much you know this is about we are not citizens in these plans you know we're very much consumers and um and so it's not the, the idea of this being about our rights and our protections. That's what's being torn up. It's very much about what's going to suit a business. I mean, they talk about, you know, like here, I, mean, I just sort of looked up the language. It's support vibrant competition and innovation to drive economic growth. And, you know, that's, you know there's no language in there about ensuring that people are protected from the, you know, um, companies and corporations that will seek to misuse their data and in all sorts of um, you know different and nefarious ways so yeah I, it's I think it's really really deeply troubling and quite dystopian I think. Thank you the, the other bit that we could briefly touch on I, which feels quite important to me is, is just how this constrains the ICO and you know political parties have really shown their cards around how they want to use data are now going to be effectively through their role in government constraining the ICO um, by making it more dependent on the governor a day and uh, you know constraining its policy setting and you know by extension therefore the activities of the political parties also um, constraining their ability to hold them to account so I, I wondered how you thought that might play out well I mean the thing about it is I think I think it's you know what's happening at the moment in Britain which I think very few people kind of have really sort of you know it's it, I think it's what's happening now is it's so comprehensive there are so many bills going through parliament there are sort of ripping up of so many rights there's this sort of you know declawing of all these different regulators and this is like another aspect of it but it's a really fundamental one you know so they're trying to as well as as, as well as um disempower the ICO, they're seeking to disempower the Electoral Commission, they're disempowering Ofcom, they're putting political appointees in places. All of these things are about safeguarding, you know, um, uh, you know, upholding the law, upholding our rights in front of the law. And um, it, it, this is, you know, it's a, it's, it really is systematic that, you know, across the board, these things are being torn up. But there is something really fundamental about the data one, because you, you know, it's, I think five years ago, I think, you know, data and tech and that was a sort of technology was over there. And we sort of thought about it, tech, you know, we had sort of tech reporters writing about technology for people interested in technology. And now, you know, the fact is it underpins every single aspect of our life. And, you know, our lives are becoming increasingly digital. And, the, you know, the more that we are online, the more that this data becomes so supremely important. And, you know, I kind of used, to, you, 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 we also don't really understand what's coming at us with AI, the scale of this disruption, the amount of power this is going to give companies. And, you know, at the moment, we've got this tiny, tiny, tiny bit of legal protection and rights under the law and ability to hold these companies to account. And that is what the government is kind of seeking to destroy. And it is so retrogressive. 
um, you know, countries in the world where they don't have these rights at the moment, they've looked across to us and, you know, seen us as a sort of shining beacon of, you know, this is the way that we want to go, you know, it took a long time, and, 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 but now we're not, this is a sort of, you know, so it's such a backward step. Oh, thank Jim. you. That, sorry, I just slightly turned myself off. Um, okay, so we'll turn now to some general questions. If people have got particular questions that they would like answered, uh, please do add them through the Q and A, and we'll try to deal with them. We've got a few uh, that have come in already. Um, they're fairly technical questions, I have to say. Um, and while while we'll try to address some of those, I think we might also try to address some of these in in uh, written form um, so one that has just come in which I think is quite interesting uh, Labour apparently have reported this afternoon a major data breach to their membership database um, as a result of a third party process of being hacked um, and the question is whether that uh, whether the consultation says anything about data security but I think uh, in addition to that it might be worth exploring a little bit about um, what the consultation says about political parties sort of took coming from what we're, the conversation we're just having with Carol. Um, um, Ravi, I don't know if you're able to respond to that. Um, Hi Jim, yeah. <clears throat> um, in terms of the, the way the consultation seeks to change the way political parties and those that political parties rely on for data processing it is quite troubling and there, there are two reasons for that firstly we have to think about the current position and then we have to think about what's being proposed the current position is that the political parties have said in terms in writing to open rights group in our litigation to the political parties that they can do anything with data that they think helps them win an election i.e. they have no constraints on what they think they can do. Anything is necessary as long as they can, it's done with a view to winning, winning an election. If that is right, that means there is no constraints on what they can do because the only reason they profile individuals to an extraordinary extent is to attempt to win elections. Therefore, no constraints. It's a free-for-all. And it's not just a free-for-all for, for the parties, but for those consultancies that, that the parties rely on. Most well-known notorious example of one of these consultancies is of course Cambridge Analytica and the idea that the government would change the law to facilitate the likes of Cambridge Analytica is troubling and that is what the consultation seeks to do it seeks to make it easier for political parties and third parties that are involved in political campaigning to process data now when you're thinking about that in that context you have to think what further constraints that they, the, these parties and those that they rely on want what kind of freedom do they want and you can see just now you know the Labour Party have been victim of the, this massive data breach and if that's right you know data breaches happen all the time but you think about the level of detail they have on individuals and do they really need that much information and moreover do they need that information on a higher level and passing around with third parties without any kind of constraints. And that's, that to me is really a really problematic um, suggestion. And it's just, you know, one of the suggestions in this massive consultation document that we should all be concerned about. And you can see in real time, when you think about the work that we've done with Open Rights Group about how the parties were processing data, following that work, the Information Commission has said that the um, Conservative Party were profiling individuals on the basis of their ethnicity. Now, if that isn't in this example of what Open Rights Group are talking about, data discrimination, I, I'm not quite sure what is. And the fact that the Information Commissioner has not further used, tried to seek, seek penalties against Conservatives for that, tried, made them stop processing, delete this data, sort out your databases. You know, today's breach just shows how problematic and troubling this all is. Thank you. Um, if nobody else wants to come in on that. Um, I might just turn to another question we had, which was about um, about workers' rights and data, which was really just, um, is there any way to strengthen the requirements for employers to inform and consult with trade union representatives, um, for example, on monitoring at work? 
I think this is quite an interesting thing because uh, we at Open Rights Group we worked with some trade unionists, including uh, James's organisation, to look at the uh, way that employees are trying to use data, um, and the ICO has got had just had a consultation on exactly this point, and it really came through very strongly that data protection impact assessments were one of the tools that trade unionists really want to use to understand the way that employers are profiling them, uh, which you know could be about the job that they receive or, or, or all the other things that James talks about. Um, so I think this is a really interesting point. Um, I'm, I'm wondering whether James and Ravi particularly might have some comment on the way that uh, trade union representatives and others might, might be consulted and what rights they have to be consulted about the way that uh, personal data is used at work. I'll mute myself. Um, I, I can start to have a, have a go at this um, by just having two, two qualifiers. Um, firstly, having more, more law and more rights is always a good thing, um, but we have to start enforcing the ones we have. I mean, Section 1 of the Employment Rights Act gives every worker a right to understand what the terms and conditions that they currently are working under are. Very important for zero hours contracts uh, workers, for example. But we have a situation now where an Uber driver, delivery rider, whatever, goes out on the street, logs in. First of all, there's a dispute about if they're working when they're actually logged in. They're certainly being surveilled. They're certainly subject to algorithmic control. But Uber and all the other platforms are saying you're not actually working in terms of uh, minimum wage and holiday pay and entitlements until they send you a job. But that's that's not what the Supreme Court and employment tribunals have, have first heard. So the, the first issue then is 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 around when when is working time. But the second issue is, is that whole section one of the ERA, which is what what are the terms of conditions I'm working under? I, don't, I haven't a clue. I haven't a clue because I can't, I don't know what my working time is. I don't know what work they're going to offer me. I don't know what my minimum wage is going to be because it is all completely opaque. You just go out there and let's see what they give you um, and go from there. And um, so already the law isn't being enforced. The second um, qualifier is that Yes, we need greater um, collective rights protection. Um, but my slight nervousness about this is that, you know, in, trade unions have to be independent, workers have to be independent, um, and they have to have access to, to their data to do as they say fit in terms of building collective power. Um, so it's really important that we have these individual and collective rights. But yes, wonderful to see the government um, do more um, to protect the collective rights uh, of workers. Thank you. Anything to add, Ravi, or to move on? Yeah, I mean, just I could, one very quick thing is <clears throat> in the um, current framing of the law um, with data protection impact assessments, there are requirements or at least obligations, not obligations, but there is a framework to consult those that will be impacted by um, new high risk technologies. And that obviously has an impact in the employment context. We've worked with unions to try to bargain for these rights to make sure it, um, employees and unions are aware of these rights, they should be impacted. And of course, one of the suggestions in the consultation is doing rid of, um, or getting rid of even, uh, data protection impact assessments. So you can really start to see when you join mm. those dots together, you start to see how this is going to disempower individuals, mm. disempower workers, mm. disempower um, individual rights. So you know, all of these things seem very high level and very abstract, but when you put it in real world context and think about the real world impacts, it's really problematic. So I think it's really imperative for people that are watching this to start to think about how the consultation might impact in the real world and what kind of submissions that could be made to make sure that these rights remain in place. Thank you. Um, you've got a, a, a question on a similar topic to, to that, which uh, Ravi's just um, been talking about, which is, um, what kind of arguments does the panel think would be the most convincing when writing submissions in defense of the current protections? Um, that's quite a, an interesting, I think quite a difficult uh, question actually, um, given that the government probably doesn't wish to be convinced. So <laughs> um, nevertheless, I, we've, got to, we've got to take it uh, that, that, that we have a chance of winning. Um, Rather than just the argument, for my own part, I would just use my chair's privilege to say, I think 
volume and breadth of consultation is probably more important than the arguments in some ways. Of course, we've got to make the right arguments, but what's really going to, I think, make the government sit up and get worried is if they see many, many different sectors, many, many different groups saying how badly this is going to affect them. So without kind of preempting what everyone's arguments for that are, my, my, my argument and reason we put this event on is simply that we need a, a lot of organizations from a lot of different directions to respond. So don't think that your one response um, is, is irrelevant. It isn't. It's, it's an extremely important thing, particularly if, it, if you're representing an organization. Um, that said, of course, it is then very important to make certain sorts of arguments and examples. So I'll, I'll turn to the panel uh, for their views on that. I'm happy to go first. I see James is unmuted as well. Should I go, or James? Yeah, go ahead, Ravi. Sorry, I didn't know. <laughs> no, I am. Um, so it's a really good question, actually, because there's, there's, as James says, there's two sides to this. The argument is in re responding to individual questions that have been raised, and then this kind of macro point about how this might impact on different industries, different sectors. So in terms of the individual um, topics, there are two sides to it for me. On the one side, a lot of emphasis be, is being put on evidence. The government consultation accepts and concedes there is no evidence for uh, some of the changes they're making. For example, the changes to Article 22, they just kind of say, we don't have any evidence, but we think we should change it. So it would be really good for people that have evidence of both from the people that are working with data, scientists, etc., to say why it's not an impediment to their work, as well as people like James has said that Article 22 really empowers individuals. It's really important for people to provide actual evidence of how this impacts on their lives. Um, and I think you can go through some of the consultation and see some of that. For example, how the balance and legitimate interests might be impacted, how imbuing purpose into subject access requests will be problematic for people in, in the real world. And then thinking about kind of the wider considerations about what's happening. I think people need to start to explain to the government that as far as I see, there are three different factors. Firstly, there's the adequacy problems that are going to arise from this. Right? If we end up not having adequacy agreements with the European, um, our European partners, then what will that mean for business in the real world? Secondly, isn't this going to lead to an increased compliance burden for individuals, for organisations, for businesses? Because there's going to be a whole new framework as well as the GDPR, if you are hoping to continue to process European data, you're going to have to comply with GDPR, as well as whatever we end up labeling this new regime. And thirdly, as we've discussed, I think in length, this is an individual rights-based regime, and people should think about this as a human rights regime. These are not rights that can be sold away. These are rights that are really important to people and have a positive impact on individuals. So giving a human voice to that is going to be really important. Change. Um, what briefly the only, the only thing I would question here is um, a little bit what Carl was talking earlier about this sort of utopian vision of a great tech future. If only if only we could unleash it. I'm, I'm not convinced by that. I'm not convinced that um, the types of rights we're trying to protect or any particular impediment to innovation or progress at all. In fact, I think probably the opposite is true. My evidence on that is that. For the limited bit of accountability that Transport London, Transport for London um, did with Uber, I understand that Uber are now saying that um, Transport for London, that that process made them a better company. Um, so <laughs> if the opposite is, must be true then, that if we, if we, have, um, if we have opacity instead of openness, um, how, how can these companies be, be better? I don't, I don't buy it. I don't buy that this openness and accountability is some kind of a uh, uh, runs counter to innovation progress. Um, and perhaps there's a way of challenging that. Um, and then finally, on this sort of issue of um, let's fee regime, I don't want to get too hung up on it, but I think it's a useful example. So it's, you know, costs 300, 600 quid uh, uh, for these firms to produce a, a, a subject access request. Um, Ravi will tell you that uh, Uber told us it was 30 hours of work <laughs> it took for each subject access request. Well, guess what? Get better at it. 
make it easier, um, innovate and get that down to low cost. And so we have, we, we can do that. But again, if we don't, if we don't have these incentives, then yeah, it will always be expensive and it will always be prohibitively difficult for these firms to achieve it. We need to challenge them on that. Thank you. Um, so, so remind the panel, do, do indicate to me if you want to uh, make, make a point. Um, I've got a, another question here, uh, which is, can personal data ever be, or can it be considered uh, like intellectual property um, or interpersonal property perhaps and safeguarded um, in a similar way? Um, as, as for thoughts on that um, and related, but not the same question, are there any moves for a public ethical data bank? like a digital triados where um, to be set up where it's not where, where, where data collected is not for profit necessarily, but as a safe alternative. Uh, I think there are quite a few um, discussions around around that sort of topic. So uh, thoughts, James, you might have something on the sort of uh, data banks point. Uh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. We're we're um, our, our vision is uh, for a data bank, a data trust for for workers, uh, and we are uh, bravely trying to knock down every obstacle that's thrown in the way of us achieving that. But um, I I would believe that um, uh, the DCMS proposals would be a serious impediment to achieving that in the longer run. But at the moment, we're trying to um, achieve every. Uh, it, it, that is exactly what we're trying to achieve realistically. Um, but again, I would just hasten to add that the, you know, the, in addition to having access to data, it's very important to have transparency of how it's processed. Thank you. On the intellectual property or interpersonal data idea, um, I don't know if Mariano has any thoughts on that. Um, if not, I do. <laughs> well, I can try to answer to that by just saying that um, uh, there is a huge academic debate on uh, whether uh, personal data should be treated as something that uh, you own physically in the same way that you own a property or not. And there are interesting, uh, let's say, outcomes of this discussion and this debate, but the most important aspect is exactly that uh, data does not work in the same way that uh, something that you own physically, like a money or a battle, et cetera, et cetera, works because it can be copied, it can be reused. And the point is exactly that from the reuse comes the fact that you uh, might be subject to decisions that affect you that you weren't expecting. And so we we'll say that, uh, I mean, on a very general level, no, like a property regime for personal data is not going to just do the trick that the GDPR is supposed to do. In particular, if you think about the fact that, by the way, this property regime doesn't exist, but the GDPR exists today. So uh, we will be scrapping something for something else that you know, like uh, somebody maybe would realize in the future, but looking at what the government is doing, I made up that they want to do it. Thank you. Um, do we have any more questions? I don't, I don't see too many. Um, I was, one person I did ask um, about the impact on devolved in, in, uh, administrations and whether they're gonna be taken out of GDPR against their will. So. That might be a good one for uh, people to respond to. So it builds on your business case, Ravi. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is a um, UK wide change um, that will impact in, in the devolved administrations equally. Obviously, the way it is interpreted by courts, and Scotland has its own court regime you know, I've worked with lawyers in Scotland to bring cases in Scotland's very different regime but it will be it will have a, a impact across the union depending on the, the form of the changes we see yeah I imagine it's going to end up being very controversial um, in Scotland and, and the impacts on uh, on adequacy similarly are, are likely to cause a, a, a lot of problems. Um, 
I haven't seen any more questions. We've got 10 minutes there's a, left. There's a question from Chris oh. Blounder, who's a real expert on yep. this stuff in, in the chat. Go for it. Yes, good. So do you agree with the prop proposition that the current information commissioner has not enforced legislation nor used her powers of investigation? That is a really good question. I think it also goes to the heart of uh, perhaps why GDPR is in a bit of trouble right now. You know, is it the is is the GDPR in trouble because it's a really bad law that, uh, as the government says, or is it in trouble because it's not being used as effectively as it might be? So perhaps those two questions are, are ones we could put put forward. Yeah, I mean, I can I can start with this. Um, I. I think credit where the credit is due to the information commissioner, the, the commissioner and the office of the information commissioner have made some good strides for particularly in respect of guidance. The information commissioner's office has put out really good guidance for some of the, the rights um, and some good codes of practice, the age appropriate design code. Um, but unfortunately, I think that might be where the credit ends. Um, I think the information commissioner has proven to be quite allergic to taking enforcement action of any kind and seems to be um, biased against data subjects and seems to really favor data controllers over data subjects, which is really problematic. And as Chris has rightly pointed out, the Information Commissioner has a range of tools available, including sim simple things like information notices, you know, just asking for information as to how um, data processing is occurring and whether there is compliance with, with the regulation. And you look, for example, at the work we're doing with Open Rights Group about the advertising technology industry. I and mean, the way the Information Commission has handled that investigation has been nothing short of embarrassing for what a regulator should be doing. And it's a regulator that following complaints from Jim, Dr. Michael Veal and Johnny Ryan in Ireland, the Information Commission put out a report saying this whole industry is acting unlawfully and has six months to, to sort out its compliance. Those six months pass and the Information Commissioner puts out a blog saying, oh, there's some changes, but we're not really going to do anything. When Open Rights Group, Dr. Veer asked questions as to why nothing's happening, why this industry is being allowed to flourish and take data on mass with no hope of it leaving that system, the Information Commissioner shut down the cases while continuing the investigation. So the complaints were continuing without the complainants. It's, it's, it should be a cause of embarrassment to the commissioner that had to go to court. And um, you know, we wait for the decision on that, but it, it really does speak volumes of the commissioners having to be taken to task just to do the basic things of finalizing a complaint. So it, it is troubling that the information commissioner has been so ineffective and so reluctant to take enforcement action and it really makes it harder for individuals to stand by their rights but even with that in mind the consultation now seeks to weaken the powers of the information commissioner and it's really hard to see how what that means in practice and it's really problematic for those that are concerned about individual data rights thank you um so we've got one more question before we i think move to closing remarks what is the expected timeline beyond the consultation? When could we expect a draft, et cetera? Does anyone have any information around that? Um, I assume Open Rights Group might have, but I would, one of the things that strikes me about this consultation is a lot of the recommendations are not to get rid of the acts and the GDPR and start again, but rather to tinker around the edges, which might be done by secondary legislation which really worries me because then you know, you're taking away parliamentary scrutiny over this stuff. So I think there's a really good question from Duncan because it, there, there really needs to be an eye on how this will be done as well as you know, any other further steps. Because if it is done in the form of secondary legislation, it might just go through without any kind of scrutiny at all. But yeah. I'd love to hear from Open Rights Group. Yeah, um, so a little bit of information from our side to say, that I think the DCMS have, have said they've come back with some kind of response in the spring. I think that's what they've been talking about. Um, but Ravi's absolutely right that uh, this could go through in, in, in statutory instruments. And that's been indicated also by some of the, met, the remarks made by uh, uh, Lord uh, Frost, isn't it? Um, who's, who's 
indicated that he thinks that European, the, the, the retained European law is so undemocratic that the only way to deal with it properly is for the government to decide with minimal parliamentary scrutiny. Um, but I think, square that as you, as you will, um, but I, I think there is a um, fundamental problem here that we've, we're, we're dealing with legislation which is very wide ranging. European legislation crosses many, many fields. It is detailed and complex. And Parliament is not great at complexity. The Lords is good at principle and the Commons is good at grandstanding. But detail is something that's left to civil servants and whoever civil servants are listening to. Um, and, and so the, the British political system has a problem. It's suddenly having to deal with things which is, its, its institutions are simply not equipped to deal with, in my view. And the right way to deal with that, of course, is root and branch reform of parliament so that it can deal with the uh, detail of, of complex legislation. But of course, that won't be the preferred avenue of the government, I'm sure. I'm sure what it will want to do is to have uh, the easiest path through taking the minimum amount of political space in parliament. So I, I think you know, there is a very, very large likelihood of this moving in some form that is not very de democratic, that keeps us as far out of the view of the public as, as possible. And that of course is a very, very troubling uh, prospect. So that is absolutely something we've got to, uh, got to kind of have an eye to. Um, so I'm going to just ask everybody, including Mike and Sarge for, um, sorry, Mariana and Sarge for some closing remarks. Um, perhaps if we uh, start with uh, Mariana, because we haven't heard too much from you, and then move to, Mar uh, to Sarge, and then I'll take through the others as well. Well, yes, as a concluding statement, I guess, uh, and also to address um, uh, one question that was posed, and so how do we react to what uh, government is proposing? I think that there is one aspect that uh, comes very clear from uh, my experience, but also from the, all the experiences that were uh, shared today, and it's the fact that this uh, proposal is basically subversive of the meaning of data protection. Everything that you're seeing around is a, a government trying to lower in things, uh, to take in away things, in order to, pro to protect basically organizations who are breaking the law against the rights and the, of the individual who are suffering this breach of the law. And um, uh, this is definitely something that uh, even if you're not a technical person or a data protection person, you can probably understand and you can probably argue in terms of uh, uh, you know, like the compatibility test or the balancing test shouldn't be scratched or should be easier exactly because uh, it is supposed to be hard. It is supposed not to allow you to do that thing. And vexatious requests should, uh, shouldn't uh, be rejected so easily exactly because it is meant to empower you to make the request. It's not meant to empower the organization to reject it and so forth. And the second part is exactly about um, uh, why government is it because in this, I have to say, I have a slightly different view of some uh, that were uh, shared today about the fact that the government is tinkering. I think that the government is really uh, shooting uh, directly at everything that uh, it's kind of working today and they're trying to undermine it. And the point is, uh, uh, this is the moment where they need to hear that there is resistance against them because they are not here to hear your views. They're not here to understand how to improve data protection. They're here to pillage and to burn, basically. And whether they uh, do this or not depends on whether they find resistance. So these are my two messages for you. Understand that they are simply subverting the meaning of things. And second of all, understand that you need to put up a fight because uh, you are the only ones who can do it. Thank you, Mariana. Sajja, how do you? What have you uh, taken the discussion today? So I was going to say that um, in our work at Open Rights Group with uh, migrants' rights groups and organisations who we support, those groups and organisations are serving individuals and communities who are who already face discrimination, who already are highly vulnerable, and these um, proposals are going to perpetuate discrimination. Um, and I, I think it's really, really important that um, 
you know, we're talking about data rights. Data rights are human rights. And it's really important that civil society organizations, not just those who work on digital rights, uh, respond to the consultation. Um, and um, I'll just like quickly say, we do have a range of resources available on our Stop Data Discrimination campaign page. So hopefully we can pop a link to that in the chat. Um, and Mariano and myself are here to um, support organizations with responding to the consultation. Thank you very much. Um, James. Well, thanks, thanks again for the opportunity to, to, to listen and learn and share. I'll close by telling a, a story of Alexandru, an Uber driver, uh, who got a final warning uh, for his alleged fraudulent activity detected on the account. Um, he challenged this. Uh, and when he got on the phone with them, um, the agent couldn't tell him, couldn't, nobody could tell him at Uber what, what the fraudulent activity was or why the system had flagged him. And it, in fact, they started to question him about what he thinks he did wrong. Um, he started a subject access request and made an Article 22 objection. And lo and behold, he got an apology. And, and, but he was told that the central systems had created a glitch. Well, get very worried when people, when tech companies start talking about glitches, like there's some random event uh, that can really destroy your life. But there is an example of accountability in these rights that we uh, may lose. And finally, um, everybody should, I agree with what Satya just said, everybody, everybody should uh, answer this consultation. But perhaps maybe we should show up at DCMS and do a demonstration as well in public in, per in person as well. I'd be up for that. Thank you. Thank you, that's great. Uh, Ravi. Yeah, I think everything's already been well addressed. I will definitely look forward to James's demonstration outside DCMS. But I, um, I definitely think this is not an abstract consultation. This is about a consultation to do with your individual rights. It's about weakening the rights you have. And it's really important that an evidence base is put to DCMS. They can really understand those real world impacts, whether that's the immigration context, the workers context or beyond. It's really important that a real world impact is put to DCMS. So they know that these rights do have consequences and removing those rights will have real world impacts as well. So I welcome everyone that's in attendance and beyond to putting in submissions. And if we can be of any assistance, please do get in, in touch as well. Thank you. And last word to Carol. Thanks, Jim. I mean, I think I just, I, I guess I just want to talk as a journalist really here about what this means for journalism. And what it means is that this is going to, you know, it's a hammer blow against accountability it's going to make our job harder. There's going to be less transparency and because there's less transparency, there's going to be less scrutiny. And because there's less scrutiny, there's going to be more abuse of power. So um, it's, 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 I, I, <laughs> I you know, I, I it really it is dystopian. I mean, I think that's the kind of like the, the last words on it is that, you know, we had last week Mark Zuckerberg unveiling his metaverse, you know, this AI future, and that is being built upon our data. And that's his vision of what it's going to look like. But for so many people, that is not going to be the reality. And, um, you know, all across the board, this amalgamation of our data and the way that it can be used and the sort of the encroaching darkness really of the way that that can be used under this legislation is that, I mean, I'm, I, I mean, <laughs> the, the, we've got the experts here really understand the, glan the granularity of all those ways. But I think the big, big picture is, um, is that this is something that we all need to be scared of and we all need to find, you know, uh, ways as Mariano said to fight this because there's very, very few people in the country who are going to do that. So it is kind of the people in your community who it really rests on, rests on to take this fight. So, um, and that's for everybody. You know, I think that we saw with the teenagers, you know, that, that sudden moment of it was an entire cohort um, who were going to be affected by these kinds of decisions. So thank you to everybody who's going to write and respond and um, send in their submissions is the rest of us are very grateful to you. So thank you. Thank you very much, Carol. So thanks everyone on the panel for uh, this discussion. Thanks everyone for attending as well. Um, there'll be a recording of this 
on on uh, YouTube and so on, and we'll put some of the clips, some of the highlights out on to uh, social media as well to give people a bit of a flavour of the discussion. Um, as everyone said, uh, we're available to help. Um, we circulated the URL. We will send that out to, again to the attendees um, so that everyone's got that information. Uh, and just please do get in touch if you want any help uh, writing your submission, reviewing it, uh, you know, getting it into shape. Uh, but please do respond. Please do make sure that the government hears loud and clear from as many directions as possible that these reforms are not acceptable uh, and we must protect our rights uh, and not undermine them as data is increasingly used. Thank you very much.